So I've already uh, saved you a little bit of time this morning because you've already uh, heard my opening story. Um, the Lord's Supper, that we're, uh, we're around this table, we're meeting around the Lord's table this morning, um, can, can seem like a very simple, small thing. <laughs> and uh, we, can, we can miss the depth of what we're taking part in um, by not taking the time to remember, observe. Uh, we're called uh, uh, as Christians to participate in this regularly. So we thought with it being back to school, and this is our first time uh, this fall meeting together around the Lord's table, we just kind of make it the focus for our whole morning this morning. Um, what's really going on here this morning in, in this place? There's, there's lots of questions, uh, but the main one I want to talk about a, a little bit at the beginning is, is remember. Remember Another uh, funny story I remember this morning is the church I grew up in, in Barrie, had a kind of a little bit more of an elaborate uh, communion table than that. And uh, if you'll remember, a lot of them looked the same in a lot of our churches. And it had the words chiseled out just under the lip of the table, in remembrance of me. And then on the one where I grew up, there was this little brass plaque with the name of the gentleman that had donated the money that paid for the table. So remember when I was Benny's age, reading that guy's name and in remembrance of me and thinking, wow, he really wants people to know that he uh, gave this table. Like, it wasn't clear to me as a kid who we're even remembering or well, what that meant. And the Lord's Supper can be like that for somebody that grows up in a church context where it happens all the time and they take it for granted. And sometimes by the time you're 11, 12, 13, you just, everybody assumes you know what it's all about and you start getting uh, almost... It feels too awkward to even ask questions. Well, well, why do we do it? What, what is this piece of bread in the cup? And what are these things all about? Well, the, the main thing we're, we're called to do is remember. And uh, remember reverses the dismembering. Something's been taken apart or lost or disconnected. And when we remember, we, we put them back together. We, we bring things from the past to the present, and, and we recall them. Uh, St. Augustine is a famous person from church history, and uh, since he exists in the time before the Reformation, he's a favorite uh, person to quote from people in, from Roman Catholic or Protestant or all the different veins of, of Christianity. And uh, he's famous for saying that, that there's three parts of our remembering in the Lord's table. Past, present, and future is how I would describe them, but he talked about them as if it was an act of recollecting, observing, and anticipating. But past, present, and future. The, the Lord's table and participating in communion involves all three of those things. But that's always how it's been in God's dealings with men throughout all of the Holy Scriptures. You can go all the way back all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 at the very beginning of the Exodus stories. And uh, I look at an extremely old text I'm going to read for you from Exodus chapter 3. This is God's, this is really early in the Moses story, right? Moses is just starting to uh, hear from God. He's been out in the wilderness and God gives Moses these instructions. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, these are three men from more than 400 years earlier. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your fathers, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. That's what God told Moses to say to his people. And I've promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, that's a lot of ites, into the land flowing with milk and honey. So past, present, and future are all there in that very ancient story. God said, I'm the God of your past, the God of your fathers, way back there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the past. In the present, I know your misery here as slaves in Egypt. And just as I promised to Abraham, in the future, I'm going to lead you into the promised land. That's a promise that's 400 years old. And God intersects with Moses, and there's that past, present, and future factor all right there. I don't know if you've ever um, um, seen something called um, a cairn. 
or heard of a street called Cairn Crossing. That's where uh, in Scotland, that's like the Scottish idea, Cairn Cross. I can't, I don't know, I don't have a good Scottish idea. If Scotty was here, he could do it perfectly. But a Cairn Crossing is like a pile of rocks. It's put there as a memento of something or a marker. And uh, again, that's an idea from the Old Testament. Um, it, it, when the people of Israel were going to be taken into the promised land finally, and these stories I'm going to jump to, they're all going to be out of order. So just so you know, I'm not giving them in order. But there's this story of when the children of Israel are finally going to go into the promised land. They cross the Jordan River. And God stopped the river so they could cross over. And the first thing he tells them to do is pile up 12 large stones. One stone to represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, what's the purpose of that? And God says to Joshua, the leader at that time, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You know, as I read that this morning, I realize this is one of the shortcomings of the fact that the kids are out in the portable right now. And it's been too long since we, we used to call it chaos communion. Once in a while, we'd have communion to keep the kids in. We'll do that again soon because I think we're missing something when your kids don't have a chance to say to you, well, what's the meaning of this bread in the cup? What's all that about? And we, we, we actually want that to happen so that you can explain to them what this is about. But that's what God says to Joshua, when the children ask you, what do these stones mean? He, he said to the Israelites, tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he'd done to the Red Sea. Another older story, when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful so that you might always fear the Lord your God. So this pile of 12 stones, past, present, and future, it's all there. It's meant to remind us that the God from the past promised we would go into the promised land. When we did it, we piled these stones up. And in the future, when your children ask that, this marker, this sign, this symbol is going to be something you can use to explain to them about the greatness of God. He proved himself. So he can and will prove himself in the future. And that would be the foundation for their life, that God had proved himself and they could count on him in the future. But they didn't always read those signs correctly. As much as God gave them clear signs like that to remind them who he is so that they could live in a certain way with that kind of confidence. Um, Numbers 13 is one of the reasons why the Karen crossing story was 40 years in the making. What do I mean by that? Is once those people were taken out into Israel, before they crossed into the Jordan River, guess what? Only two people were in that group that crossed over from all of the millions that came out of Egypt. Um, because they, they had not listened to the signs. And what's that story? Well, when they were released from Egypt, um, there's a lot of incredibly important stories. The Exodus is just a foundational Bible story. But you remember the story of the spies that went in to spy out the land beforehand. And... Twelve went out, and our children's song would say, ten were bad and two were good. And they had a two-man clump of grapes. Now, that's a large thing of grapes. When they're so bounteous, it takes two men to carry them. And that's meant to be a sign. Because what did God promise to Abraham? Hundreds of you, I'm going to send you into a land flowing with milk and honey. So you would think as they walked in with this symbol of God's faithfulness to his promise and see these grapes, they would have said, this is exactly how God said it would be. This is amazing. They saw the grapes, but they also saw the people on the other side. And they became afraid of them. They said, they're like giants. We're like grasshoppers in their midst. And they didn't trust God at his word. And so as a result of that, the nation wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they crossed in. They, they, that clump of grapes, if they had observed it and applied it to their future, it would have done something other than have them be in the fear they had of the large report of enemies. Remember, these are the same people who once had Pharaoh's army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them. And God found a way out of no way out there. These are the same people that had seen that, 
but they have a clump of grapes and they just hear from 10 people, those guys are pretty tough in there. I don't think we can do this. And the fear took over their lives. And they became wilderness wanderers. I saved another tactile sign until now as the ultimate connect with the Lord's Supper, and that's Passover. Remember, I told you I wasn't going to tell these stories in order. Well, Passover, while they're still in Egypt, and they've been slaves for 400 years, that means I don't ever remember not being a slave. My father doesn't ever remember not being a slave. His father, it's all they've known. And this message comes through Moses, and God's message proves true. Um, but before it does, they're, they're told to do something. They're told to have Passover. They're, they're told to take a lamb and sacrifice it and put blood on their doorpost, and they are to eat that tonight and eat it because they're going to be on a long road trip tomorrow. They're to eat it packed, ready to go. They don't know how that's going to happen. They had to take God at his word that he's going to free them tomorrow. They eat that Passover, and God's avenging angel passes over their homes. Their children are spared, and they're taken out. So that's, that's what Passover is now going to remember. All right? Are you following me? So then every year after that, they're told to celebrate the Passover and eat a Passover meal in their homes long after they've been in the promised land. For year after year after year, they would celebrate being passed over, eating the same foods, virtually reenacting the event, which is recollecting the past, observing the sights, sounds, and feelings that their ancestors went through, and considering their hope for the future that God can be trusted when he gives a promise and they were to observe Passover. And while they participated in that with their children, Exodus 13 says, once again, here's the children asking, what's going on? How come we have to eat the same thing again? Why are we eating the same meal again? They were to tell them of the first Passover and say, this is from Exodus 13, in days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt by his mighty hands. A constant reminder every year that as a people, life came from death, the sacrifice of firstborn lambs meant you trusted God to provide secondborn lambs. And there's that biblical pattern of remembering that's established in the Old Testament. Actively calling on God's grace and salvation, bringing it to mind, bringing the past into the present with hope for our future. It, it's more than just casually reminiscing about the past or casting a few wishful thoughts back there somewhere. Because for generations, living in the times after the events themselves, there's, there's actually nothing back there in terms of their experience. What do I mean by that? They weren't there when it happened. It's so crucial to who they are as a people, but they weren't there, and God knows we're prone to forget. We're prone to not remember. So God built in this institution of Passover so they would remember. Uh, all those ancient biblical remembrances, the feast, the cairn, the stone, all point back to moments in history. But it's, to them, it's not just some historical facts or to recall a piece of personal experienced history. It's to take part in those events now and remembering them. The, you know, a, a child could be asking, well, why are we even here in the land now eating unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and sacrificing these animals? And the answer was because of what God did for us in Egypt. Even though it's hundreds of years later, when you sat down in Canaan land 300 years after the Exodus, you believed God did something for us in Egypt. Why are the rocks piled up? Because God, something that God did for us. This kind of remembering was meant to, to inform you of what happened, but also to shape you, to sustain you, to give you hope. And in the same kind of pattern, we're meant to apply that when we hear the words at communion that I didn't understand as a kid, do this in remembrance of me.
If you look in your Bibles, I think I have slides up in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Early in the chapter, it's a full paragraph before Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. He writes in verse 2, I praise you for remembering me and everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. And then later on in verse 23, he said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians to tell the story of the Last Supper when Jesus met around that table. Remember, Paul wasn't actually there in that room. Paul's giving him the instructions of a meal that happened that Jesus started for a specific reason and that was told to Paul and Paul's passing it on to them and they're all meant to remember what happened in that upper room. He even says in the same, in the same passage, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you've taken your stand. So just as Moses passed on the Lord's instructions to the Israelites, so our apostles passed on what they received from Jesus to us. And just as Passover was central to the Israelites' identity as a people, uh, even to the point I understand it became like the thing that marked the beginning of their calendar year, so the Lord's Supper becomes central to the life of the church, the people of the new covenant. In the Old Testament, Israel was supposed to remember and celebrate their release from slavery in Egypt, deliverance through blood. So members of the new covenant celebrate deliverance from bondage to sin, salvation through the body and blood of Christ. Along with baptism, the Lord's Supper is the defining and shaping event in the life of a church. It reminds us that we were bought with a price in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, the price being the life of our Lord Jesus Christ the same one who promised to never leave us or forsake us. In Matthew 28 and John 14, when we take the bread and the cup, we, we relive, not reenact, but we, we, we take part in what God has done and doing, is doing, and is yet to do for us. So the Lord's Supper this morning is about something that God's already done for what God continues to do in our life as a community of faith and what we can count on God to do for us in the future. You think of the very tactile nature, the, the breaking and eating the bread and drinking the cup. And they, they point explicitly to the death of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 quotes Jesus as saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew has Jesus specifically saying, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we hear that word new covenant, we tend to think of uh, innovation. It's something completely new, never seen before. And, it, and it's not so much an innovation as it's an, an inauguration of a whole new way of God doing what he's always done in the lives of people. Um, they were centuries in the waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for, for real forgiveness and a new relationship with God. And, and when we participate in it, just like my story of that little tiny string that crossed the Niagara Gorge the first time, it, this is such a small little cup. Now I know in 2024, we have these little tiny plastic cups. I don't mean that. I mean even at the Lord's Supper. In that room with the 12 apostles, what had Moses done? Uh, I'm going to tell you the story in a few minutes. Um, I'll tell it now. In, uh, when Moses inaugurated the new covenant in the book of Exodus, it tells us that he also had 12 stones, one representing each of the tribes of Israel. And he slaughters a bull and half the blood gets poured on these 12 stones and the rest he splatters on the people. Now, there's a million people out here so I don't think every single person was touched with that. But it's a huge amount of blood and yet if you were part of that great crowd, here's just blood being poured on a stone and that stone represents your tribe. Now you think about the Lord's Supper. That Passover. And Jesus passes one small cup to each of those 12, and they take it. 
They, they internalize it. They drink it. It's such a, a, it's such a powerful picture. It's so much closer, so much more intimate. And Jesus said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord's made with you in accordance with all these words. Those were Moses' words, and that's what Jesus is referring to. Moses talking in Exodus 24. Now, the sad thing in Moses' day is that once Moses did that, the people all said, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey in Exodus 24, but they don't. There are many more stories in the Old Testament of them being taken off into exile. The sad thing is they didn't keep the covenant. It would be broken by them. So when Jesus calls this cup the new covenant in my blood, is there more hope for a better outcome from this? I already talked about this small cup being so much more powerful than that giant amount of blood in the Old Testament. Well, as far back as Jeremiah 31, we read things like this. And this is when that covenant-breaking thing had happened by the nation of Israel. At this point, they're either already taken off into exile or it's imminent that the rest of them are going to be taken off into exile. And Jeremiah gives this hope in Jeremiah 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. There's that. There's those words. Remember how I said when we read it in the New Testament, it sounds like an innovation? It's an inauguration of something that was promised hundreds of years earlier. So when Jesus says new covenant, he's talking about something that was spoken of hundreds of years earlier. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach each other or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This, unlike the last one, won't be broken. This one will be internalized, written on their minds and hearts. God's promise to forgive sins once for all. Another prophet, Ezekiel, said this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave to your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be my God, your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine among you. So this table right here, thousands of years later, affirms the reality of the fulfillment of those prophecies. Those invited to this table have been cleansed from sin, have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, have been given new hearts. The communion words poured out for many hearken back to the Old Testament prophets as well. Isaiah talked about a day when a future figure would come called the servant of Yahweh who would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, by whose wounds we are healed. He would bear the sins of many. Jesus dies in the place of others. For even the Son of Man, he said, did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Another powerful line we read when we read the accounts of Jesus' last days before the cross were frame the first time they met and had that, the Last Supper. When Jesus was about to say these words about the new covenant, he said, the gospel writers say, on the night he was betrayed. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus makes these promises about this great blessing of a new covenant. It still stops me in my tracks when I hear it. It's, it's so indicative of how selfless Jesus really was. But closer to home, it, it needs to remind me that the sin of Judas selling Jesus out for a bag of silver lurks within me as well. I, I should come to the Lord's table, you know, mindful of the fact that I, I have betrayed him. 
which leads to another question in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul warns the Corinthians to uh, examine yourself. He says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So many uh, stories there are in the Old Testament where something like the Ark of the Covenant is being carried and it starts to totter and somebody goes and grabs it that has no business touching it and they're struck dead. And sometimes we carry those stories into the meeting around the Lord's table and think, is that kind of what it's about? Um, am, I, am I worthy of even participating in something so incredible? And I often tell people... Um, If you've given your heart to Christ and you've called on him as your savior, you, you've been made right. Um, somebody that would come to the Lord's table and think, and not examine themselves or think, oh, I got it made, I'm, I'm fine. That person probably has something to be concerned about. Uh, our worthiness is Christ's. Uh, an awareness of our sin. You take the time before the Lord's table and you... You do business with God and you confess your sins to him in your heart, in your mind. You prepare yourself that way based on what Jesus has done, not on something that I've done. At the very least, you should take the opportunity to be honest with God at a moment like this. It's not the idea of achieving some kind of moral perfection in order to qualify. If, if you could do that, you wouldn't need to be here in the first place. A person who's actually worthy is only so as a result of faith in Jesus' perfection on his behalf. So I suppose a self-righteous attitude would qualify as being unworthy um, by considering yourself worthy outside of faith in Christ. Um, here's something that should be of comfort to someone who's perhaps too scrupulous about their individual worthiness. When Paul makes that statement, that you should examine yourself. He's primarily speaking to a group that at large had gotten so dysfunctional, this church in Corinth, that they, they, for them to sit down as a group and pretend that they were somehow displaying genuine fellowship and unity with one another in Christ was a complete insult to everything that they were pretending to do. And Paul's reminding them, hey, you're not even right with one another. <laughs> You're abusing one another. You're, you're, you're committing sin against one another. You, you need to examine that. You need to think about that. We've talked in previous sermons in the Psalms that God, God wants obedience more than he wants sacrifice. He wants our hearts more than he wants our gifts. Their key sin was pride and judging one another by the world's standards. And the Lord's table should have reminded them of their common need of grace, no one needing more than another. The event should be the ultimate reminder of unity in Christ as we gather together around the table with a common need and humility of heart. Rather than looking for reasons to disqualify one another, considering some greater than others, we all come as sinners in need of grace. And if you don't see yourself in that way, I'd recommend you, you abstain from participating and just observe it. And maybe after uh, over a sandwich and corn, say, well, what was that you were doing in there? What, what did all of that represent? Tell me about what the Lord's Supper is. Then my last point this morning before we go to the table is Paul says that by meeting in this way, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're preaching the gospel to each other when we meet around the Lord's table. So, so in some ways, we're, we're, we're recommending that you not bear false witness, that you preach the gospel to one another as you participate in something like this. It, it's not just, uh, the gospel is for everyone. It's the way that great divide was crossed, but it's also the way we are to live among one another. And we're forgetful. So the Lord's Supper should call the death of Jesus powerfully to mind through the visible signs of the bread and cup. In fact, the physical act of taking the supper is a reminder that our help comes from outside of ourselves. Our help comes from outside of ourselves. We reach out in faith to take the bread and the cup. We reach out to take the bread and the cup, and in faith we have to reach out to the salvation that Jesus proclaimed, that God is for us. <clears throat> 
We say that the New Testament version of what was said at the Passover long ago, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I was forgiven and released from my slavery to sin. The table's not just an invitation to a history lesson. It's a reminder that Christ's presence is with us in a powerful way, and it's to feed our hope that we can trust God for the future that he's promised to us, just as he was faithful to send his son as a sacrifice for our sin in the, path, in the past. I traded messages with a friend on the other side of the ocean who was praying for a very powerful thing, and he said, if God wills, this will happen. And I, I, I interacted with them and I said, the injustice that you're facing is not God's will. It, it sounded almost defeatist, the way that it came out. Um, we know that God's will is for people to give their hearts, their lives to Christ as their Savior. And uh, God made a way possible to cross that gorge. And... Uh, I would invite you to think about God's will for your life in that way. The Lord's Supper as a proclamation of the gospel that leads us away from ourselves to Christ, who invites us to come to his table, to remember him, to believe in him, and to trust him for our future. Let's do that this morning. Let me pray as the worship team comes back up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these reminders that we're called to remember. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts as we meet around this table. Lord, um, I pray that um, we will seriously consider our lives before you and that we will examine them. Lord, have, have I trusted in you? as my Savior? Lord, am I fearful of my future or can I trust you for my future as well? Or do I believe that you're really present among us and that you're reminding me of that even here today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.